Welcome Polaris employees. Today we're going to be discussing the effects of elevated interest rates on banks, businesses, and consumers alike with one of our senior advisors. His name is Wesley Boudreau. And if you stick around after his presentation, he'll also be answering some questions. Uh, before Wesley comes on, I'd like to just quickly remind you that we are not affiliated nor endorsed by Polaris. The retirement group is a completely separate entity, so keep that in mind as you listen along. And if you happen to see any YouTube cards popping up on your screen, they will guide you to several different resources we have available, one of which may simply be a link to a past video that might also be of interest or concern to you as a Polaris employee, so take advantage of those. And without further ado, here is Wesley Boudreau. Hi, Wesley. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that uh, introduction, Samantha. And uh, like she said, uh, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different than what we're used to talking about. Usually we go into uh, company-specific details, but we're going to talk about kind of the economic conditions in general, what we're potentially seeing here uh, for 2024, some of the headwinds, some different job situations we've already seen happen. Uh, and then we'll also uh, talk a little bit about, um, about the banking crisis last year, not crisis, but some of the banking issues last year. And uh, some of those are continuing, it looks like, unfortunately, uh, this year as well. So jumping into it, again, like I mentioned, uh, the current landscape, uh, we're going to go through that. We'll talk about the interest rates and kind of impacts of what we'll see with the Fed Reserves, um, whether they're going to uh, excuse me, continue to keep the rates steady? Uh, are they going to drop those? What's the likelihood of that dropping? What's the likelihood of a potential recession versus soft landing? But right now, there's a lot of headwinds still we're looking at for the economic uh, uh, future for 2024. Um, some of those different things would be, again, the monetary policy. We've seen those uh, rise in interest rates over the last uh, year and a half or two years or so. Um, honestly, uh, kind of quite surprised we've had more of a soft landing so far. And a lot of that's because of uh, some of the different, uh, you know, pent up demand post uh, post pandemic. Um, there's still been, even though there's job cuts, there's also uh, job opportunities uh, 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 scattered across America still. Um, and uh, what we'll see is uh, it, it feels like we're slowly kind of trickling through that monetary policy. So we should still see some potential slowdowns, uh, but hopefully not a recession here. Uh, there's still obviously geopolitical risk, uh, you know, dealing with Russia, uh, China, Middle East situations. Um, the consumer, given all these uh, interest rate increases, the inflationary pressure we've seen, um, has been fairly resilient so far. Uh, we may see the consumer start to bend, hopefully not break, but uh, bend and be a little bit more cautious about the spending. But hopefully the goal is that uh, that, that inflationary pressure has kind of slowed down. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that we haven't erased the, uh, <laughs> the, the rising costs that we've seen over the last two, or, uh, two years or so. Um, and again, like I said, unemployment is a little bit higher. We're, uh, it's expected to be a little bit higher, but still well within um, the long-term averages. So that's still a, a safe situation, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the job cuts we've seen recently and some that may be coming forward as well. And then, uh, you know, housing uh, situation, we've seen a pretty big drop in that over the last 18 months or so. I think about 30 to 40% drop, given obviously the rising interest rates. Uh, those rising interest rates also are affecting the commercial real estate market, which is going to be part of a discussion we'll have a little bit later here and uh, how that's affecting uh, mostly regional banks because it's usually regional banks that uh, that will lend out money to uh, commercial real estate development. Uh, but uh, right now we've got, I think it's about uh, close to 500, uh, uh, 500 million, excuse me, 500 billion um, that's actually uh, coming due in this year for uh, uh, where the rates will be reset. So a lot of that's going to be a situation to uh, look into as well. The Federal Reserve, um, you know, their job is to obviously create that soft landing, which, like I said before, um, they've actually done a pretty good job. Um, and a lot of that has been with the help of, uh, like I said, pent up demand, um, you know, supply chain issues, where usually what we'll see is the rising interest rates will affect, uh, you know, the auto industry, but not quite as much because we've had pent up demand because there was a lack of supply back during the pandemic. Uh, so a lot of these things are kind of uh, you know, coming into uh, into a, a situation where we may see some adjustments and some of those monetary policies finally trickling in. Uh, the goal for the Fed is going to be to actually try and, again, create that soft landing. Uh, right now, they've got the Fed fund rates target at that five and a quarter to 5.5%. Um, we will see if they rate, if, excuse me, if they lower those uh, in the coming months or so. Uh, expectations are that we should start to see a reduction in those interest rates uh, coming around the summer uh, months or so. Um, a great tool that's actually used is a CME group puts out a, uh, um, a tool that gives you the, uh, um, essentially what it does, it, it runs the futures market and the interest rates. So it's taking a look at uh, what traders expect to happen. And so far it's been fairly uh, accurate as far as the Fed almost uh, using that, to, you know, in order to 
and make their decisions because they're seeing what the market wants and what the market expects. Um, but um, right now we've got, to, I think it's about a 97% chance of uh, no changes in the next March meeting. Um, then that's going to uh, change to, I think, about a uh, about 70% chance of no changes or so in the uh, May meeting. But then we get into the summer months in June and July. Uh, it's actually flips. There's actually about a 70% chance or so of them starting to drop rates in June. And it goes up to, I think, close to about a 90% chance last I looked, uh, maybe 80 or 90% chance of them starting to drop those even more in uh, the July months. So this could be good. It could be bad. I mean, you know, the target is usually 2%. And what you're going to look at is the Fed wants to keep that target around 2%. But again, that doesn't negate anything that's happened over the course of uh, of the last couple of years. That doesn't reduce prices. That would be deflation. Um, so again, if you had a, you know, the cost of a hamburger was $5. And let's say if it went up, you know, 10% for two years, let's say that went to five fifty, dollars then a little bit over $6. Even if inflation stopped, you're still paying 20% more, $6 for a hamburger that cost you $5. Uh, two years ago. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, the the goal or the fear is we want to uh, continue and avoid a recession. But a lot of times when uh, interest rates start to start to decline, especially if they decline, uh, you know, significantly, that could be a sign that a recession is around the corner. Historically, we've seen this when interest rates uh, drop, we tend to see a recession afterwards. Uh, but again, we'll keep a we'll keep a watch on that. And uh, hopefully, uh, again, the Fed does their job and there's a soft landing here. So another thing that we've seen is uh, some different issues with the uh, job markets, um, you know, different uh, layoff situations. We'll talk a little bit about the New York Community Bank, uh, their crisis they're going through here in the first quarter of 2024, and uh, some of the factors that led to that uh, and how that could be a uh, some factors across the board for other situations as well. But right now, we've seen uh, tens of thousands of job cuts already in uh, the first quarter of uh, 2024. A lot of this is coming from the tech and uh, media sector. And a lot of it actually is, uh, you know, you could be say, you could say is uh, induced from uh, the growth of AI. Um, actually, there was a study, uh, I think it was about 900 um, um, different uh, firms and, and, and those that are responsible for recruiting and hiring said about four out of 10 said that they're either looking at hiring freezes or reductions because of the potential that AI has already brought on board uh, for them. Um, and you're also seeing a rising trend of, uh, of I, I shouldn't laugh at this, but a rising trend of people actually documenting uh, their layoffs. Um, so uh, you may have seen this last year and you might still see some more of it this year where people understand and know they're going to be uh, getting let go and people are either recording those phone calls or doing a uh, TikTok or YouTube videos about it. So it's definitely a trend. Um, but again, uh, you know, what we've actually seen is uh, um, there are other jobs still out there. They just may not be in your specific sector. Like I said, tech's been the one that's been hit hardest. Uh, medium uh, companies like uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Citigroup actually announced significant layoffs. Even UPS, uh, Citigroup, I think it was 20,000. Uh, UPS, about 20,000. Uh, some of these are pretty significant, uh, significant impact. But like I said, most of them are going to be uh, in the tech industry. We had about 260 some odd thousand last year, already about 65,000 announced for this year, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, but uh, going forward, we could continue to see some of these job cuts. But uh, like I said, it's a combination of, of you know, some cases, AI. Um, bringing, uh, bringing in uh, the ability for some of these companies to work without those employees in certain areas. But a lot of it's also going to be kind of post-pandemic. Uh, you know, we had a hiring uh, a hiring feast, if you would, after the pandemic where uh, companies needed people for that rebound They and they had to overpay them in some cases to get them in there. So now that's kind of working its way through the system. They're understanding the cost associated with that and they're able to lean up and actually reduce some of their uh, their headcount uh, in order to kind of go back to uh, you know pre-pandemic type levels as well. Now another issue that we're coming uh, coming into is we uh, we saw some of the banking issues uh, about this time February March of last year um, when we're starting to see it again unfortunately and uh, this is really kind of geared around uh, commercial real estate but uh, New York Community Bank is one that uh, is going through a crisis right now where we saw um, back at the very beginning of uh, of uh, February. Um, their stock price plummeted by about 40% or so. We've actually just seen it here um, kind of rebound a little bit, and then it's uh, dropped again uh, quite a bit uh, um, just in the last day or so. And a lot of that's coming on the aspect of uh, taking a look at their books. Um, so they were one of the ones that actually bailed out Signature Bank last year. And one of the things that happened was by bailing them out, they're taking on their assets under management, but they're also taking on a lot of their bad loans. And a lot of these uh, these loans are coming due and they're needing to be refinanced at uh, higher interest rates. But one of the biggest issues was because they uh, they took over this bank, uh, took over Signature Bank, 
they brought in their assets. So what that did, that, that rose their assets under management. And by getting over $100 billion, that uh, also rose their requirements for the Federal Reserve and as far as what needs to be kept in reserves. And uh, so that changed a lot of different factors for that company. And uh, But it was as easy, I mean, excuse me, as recent as January, where they were paying very high dividends and everybody had them touted pretty well. Uh, and, we're, and then, you know, once these started coming due and we're starting to see this, then you're seeing it take effect. Now, again, this is commercial real estate leading to a lot of this, and usually it's regional banks. So we're not seeing this, uh, you know, amongst the big national banks, but again, it could trickle in as we see more of these loans uh, reset coming forward. I think I talked about some of this already here. Again, a significant portion of their portfolio was in uh, commercial real estate loans, and those refinancing situations are driving some of this. Um, but, uh, you know, they've come in and they've had to readjust and they've had to uh, had to increase equity or have a call to increase equity. Um, and again, similar to just to kind of hopefully calm some fears, similar to what we had last year, um, a lot of it was driven by interest rates. It didn't mean that the banks were necessarily insolvent. It just meant that if there was a bank run, um, and I think of It's a Wonderful Life when I, I think of something like that, but it, if there was a bank run, then they wouldn't necessarily have all the uh, all the assets available in order to pay out immediately. They'd have to sell some of their assets. And by selling some of those assets, they would sell them at a loss because interest rates have gone up and they're higher, which would reduce the um, uh, what somebody would be willing to pay for one of those uh, assets they have that maybe paid lower interest rates in the past. Okay, So uh, we'll see if this kind of trend uh, uh, um, factors in uh, the rest of the year or so. Um, hopefully it does not, and hopefully it's going to be uh, mitigated. But uh, like I said before, in looking at this, um, going back uh, uh, in January, um, uh, you know, New York Community Bank was touted as you know having a great dividend. I think it was maybe seven point nine percent or something like that, um, and touted as a great value buy. And then uh, you know, fast forward just a couple of days later or so, that we saw that precipitous drop, and then a lot of people said, hey, it's an even better value buy." But now we've seen it drop even further. So, in summary, just be very careful about individual stock investing. Um, again, uh, you know, the retirement group, we focus on value investing. You can look up one of our webinars to go over that or give us a call. Um, we do tend to focus on uh, a margin of safety, trying to protect the principal and the and the stock portfolios that we that we do run. But you want to make sure you're diversified. Um, you want to make sure that uh, if you are looking at individual stocks, uh, you do your research and do your homework. Even then, uh, you may you may not have all the information that you need. And uh, you need to be focused on staying resilient in different times like this. I'm not trying to paint any you know, uh, doom and gloom picture. Uh, chances are it looks like we're going to kind of transition through this uh, fairly smoothly. Um, we've actually had a, uh, a fairly uh, a fairly decent run um, in the, or increase in the S&P 500 here so far year to date. Um, you know, typically in the fourth term of a president cycle, we tend to have muted growth. So we, we may see kind of a, just ebbs and flows here into the election, but obviously depending upon your take on the election, we could see some different changes uh, leading up to it or post election as well. But the best thing to do is go ahead and review your overall portfolio and make sure that's in line with what your goals are. And the best way to kind of run those goals is not just say, hey, I'm a risky investor or investor or I'm conservative, but it's to actually run a cash flow analysis or a financial plan. Uh, right now, about three-fourths of Americans over 50 don't even have a written plan. Uh, one of the things we do provide at the retirement group is a complimentary cash flow analysis, especially beneficial for those of you that are uh, you may be a couple years out from retirement or five years out from retirement. You want to see, hey, am I on the right path to retire? Can I retire when I want to? Should I you know, increase my savings? Can uh, Do I have to decrease my spending retirement? We can go through all those different aspects. And once we have that answer, that can then lead into, okay, how should this portfolio be allocated? Should you make any changes in your 401k? Uh, are there better options in an IRA? We can go through all those different choices with you, but it's best to get a plan together to do that first. Now, I know we kind of Jumped in the update and left some of this information for later. But uh, again, for those of you that do not know who we are, uh, the Retirement Group, we are an independent financial advisory firm that focuses on working with uh, mostly Fortune 500 companies and helping their uh, employees transition into retirement. A lot of these companies, uh, our advisors work specifically with uh, maybe only three or four or five. So we have a deep understanding of your specific benefits plans. So rest assured, if you've got questions, we can uh, go through everything from the the pension, the 401k, healthcare retiree medical benefits, life insurance continuation, things like that, and make sure that you understand as you transition how you can maximize those benefits from your specific company. We do have offices throughout the country, so we can probably accommodate you uh, in person, but obviously this day and age, it's very easy to have a lot of web meetings or phone calls, whatever your preferred communication is. Just let us know. But again, that cash flow analysis I mentioned before, that is complimentary. So if you have any questions, want to dig into what your situation is, go ahead and take us up on that. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, dig into it for you. 
And I'll see if, uh, Samantha, we had any questions come through. But uh, while we do that, I'll leave this up here. Uh, there's a couple of QR codes on there if you want to get into uh, our, our LinkedIn page to uh, stay updated on your specific company plan uh, information. Or if you want to schedule an appointment with myself or one of our other uh, advisors, you can get into our calendars there as well. And you can always reach us at info at retirementgroup.com with any questions or call us at 800-900-5867. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, yeah, we got just a couple questions. We're going to keep it short. Um, number one, how do massive layoffs affect the overall stock market stability? Uh, okay, so it, it's going to depend. I mean, it, it could it could come into it from a couple of different scenarios. Uh, uh, mostly layoffs are going to affect the independent company first. Um, so let's take a look at, uh, as I mentioned, the Citigroup before. They made that announcement of 20,000 layoffs back, I think it was uh, the second week of January or so. Um, you know, investors actually liked that because they saw they were leaning, uh, leaning up and becoming more efficient and that that stocks up, uh, I want to say it might've been like eight or 9% since then. Um, so in some cases it can benefit a company, other cases it can, uh, it can have a negative sentiment, but if you fast forward and say, we got massive layoffs across the board, you know, nationwide, then obviously that could have a trickle down effect because if you've got more people, getting let go, then that could reduce consumer demand or consumer purchasing power, which in turn could hurt the market. But right now we're we're in a we're in a point where it doesn't seem like that's an issue. I know I think I mentioned before we might see the consumer bend, but probably not break. Um, even though we've had those layoffs we talked about, uh, you know, the job numbers in January were were great. Um, so again, it just may be an issue of we got layoffs in one section, but we got hiring in another section. So it may be, you know, shifting your focus and shifting your your job mentality. Uh, but so far so good. Ready. Thank you. Uh, next one. What's the likelihood of a recession given the current economic indicators and how should I prepare my portfolio? Okay. So uh, two questions in there. Um, I mean, if you asked me this a year ago or so, I would have said there's maybe more likelihood, but uh, like I said, it's uh, we've actually kind of experienced or had that soft landing or maybe not a soft landing, but a, a delay mm -hmm. of that potential soft landing so far in 2023, because of some of the issues I mentioned before. Um, again, a lot of the uh, the, uh, the expectations are for not necessarily a, a full out full recession, but maybe a mild recession or a soft landing coming in uh, in the middle of summer. So uh, let's say you know the, the the latter part, the second part of 2024, we may see something like that, but it's not expected to be severe uh, so far at this point. But again, there's like we said, there's always other headwinds and things that could change that. But uh, generally speaking, we shouldn't see. Uh, much recession. Now, as far as how to how to uh, attack your portfolio, um, again, it goes back to uh, understanding what your goals and your risk is. You know, somebody who may have 20 more years of uh, work ahead of them versus somebody looking to retire next year is going to have different risk tolerance. Um, so you need to understand that first, but uh, and then look at that diversification approach. And you may want to, you know, make some tactical allocation changes here or there, but by no means you want to go in and try and time it and get all in or all out of the market. But a, a good thing to be aware of is a lot of people uh, kind of uh, shied away and got out of bonds over the last decade or so because the interest rates were so low. We finally seen these interest rates come up. And so you've got good yields in bonds. So it may be good to uh, look at that again, because if we do see interest rates drop, then we'll actually see price appreciation in those bonds as well, because um, if interest rates are lower, uh, somebody is going to be more attracted to your higher paying bond yield uh, that you may have right now. So again, uh, best to give us a call and look at your portfolio, but uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you, Wesley. We're going to just do one more. But before I ask this last question, I just wanted to remind everybody that there are several links in the chat. Uh, you can book an appointment with Wesley. You can also use the QR codes that he has up on his screen. Uh, we'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Follow us on YouTube with the retirement group. Um, alrighty, Wesley, last question. How does the high interest rate environment impact my decision to either continue working or retire early? Okay. Um I, I guess the question could go two ways, depending upon what was what was meant by it. But uh, if we have continued high interest rates, obviously that means um, we've got you know continued inflation and things are getting more expensive, and uh, so your purchasing power is eroding. So just from a an overall standpoint, uh, you know if if you want to be safer about you know your overall situation, work another year or two, you know mm -hmm. of of making income versus spending money, that could be beneficial for you. Um, so that's just one way to look at it. Uh, but at the end of the day, running that cash flow analysis is the best way to see. You may be surprised. You may have enough money set aside. You may be able to retire sooner than you want. And the question becomes, what's an extra year or two of retirement versus employment You know, mean to me emotionally? Uh, but the flip side of that question, which may be what uh, it's alluding to, a lot of the companies that the retirement group works with 
um, they still actually have pensions. And a lot of those pensions uh, do have what are called lump sum uh, conversion calculations, and those are tied to interest rates. So if you're one of those companies and you're having questions about your pension taken as an annuity or a lump sum, um, if you're thinking lump sum, as those interest rates come down, you'll actually see your lump sum uh, increase. So it may be beneficial to actually hang on a couple more months or a couple quarters or even a year more uh, in order to get a bump in your lump sum calculation. But those are ones, give us a call. We can definitely go in there. And that really ties into uh, running a pitch and estimate for you and, and digging into that cash flow analysis to show you uh, the benefit of, you know, you know, whether you leave now versus hold on for another year, you know, get an extra year uh, income as well as maybe you may make an extra 50 grand or more on your pension. So it's really up to running those numbers to see that. And you had said you. that was the last question, I think. Yeah, that was it. Okay. So just uh, as she said before, a quick reminder, uh, even though I talked a little bit about some of the companies we work with, um, we're not specifically employed or endorsed by them, but uh, our advisors have worked extensively with a lot of them uh, and some over for over 30 years. So just give us a call and we'll be happy to dig into anything on those and uh, run those reviews for you. But you can reach us at 800-900-5867. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.